Thanks for that great conversation. Next up, we have another lightning talk. Ashley Axios is a strategic creative and an advocate for the design's ability to break barriers and create positive social change. She's the chief experience officer at Ann Partners and also the president elect for the American Institute of Graphic Arts, the professional association for design. Ashley previously formed and led the in-house creative agency at Automatic. And before that, we got to work together when she was the creative director and digital strategist at the Obama White House in the Office of Digital Strategy. Ashley creates beautiful products and helps policy nerds like a lot of us think about how to better showcase our work. She's going to talk to us today about the power of partnerships. So please join me in welcoming Ashley. Thank you all. You get set up here. Um, I usually give like 45 minute talks. So doing a 20 minute talk and a new one, I've got some, uh, some notes here to help keep me on task. <clears throat> but I already know I'm gonna go off script, so wish me luck. Um, so hi everybody, thanks for having me today. It's my honor to be here to talk to you a little bit about the power of partnerships from my own perspective. Um, but first, I'll give you a little introduction to myself. Here's me as a kid and me and my mom. Um, I like to say I'm a, I'm a woman, I'm mixed race, I'm introverted, I'm uh, bisexual, I'm married. My brother and I were raised by a hardworking single mom with a disability. Uh, I'm a survivor. <laughs> uh, I'm a designer, a strategist, a facilitator. I've been successful in highly exclusionary political and technical spaces. I co-founded and built up .gov Design, an initiative, conference, and curriculum empowering government designers. I was an art director in the Obama White House and uh, earned my position as a creative director, uh, the first female, the youngest, and one of the longest serving designers in the uh, Obama White House, serving for more than four years as a part of the Office of Digital Strategy. I built up the in-house creative team at Automatic, a fully remote tech company. Um, the focus behind WordPress.com, uh, believing in and building up uh, part of the heart of open source. I'm on the board of AIGA, which as mentioned is the Professional Association for Design. It's actually the largest and oldest association for design in the world. Um, where I am president-elect. <laughs> We're in the middle of an organizational turnaround, completely transforming this, um, this uh, organization um, to better serve designers across the country. And I'm the chief experience officer at AND Partners, uh, where we use human-centered design, research, and technology um, to build ethical solutions and solve worthy challenges with worthy and trustworthy partners. So full disclosure, we're one of your sponsors here today. <laughs> um, and, and happy to be here. But I say all of that not, one, because it's comfortable to get up and tell so much about myself to a bunch of strangers. As I mentioned, I'm an introvert, so part of me is like, <laughs> just wants to go and hide behind the podium. It's not a comfortable place. It's not something like I'm opting into out of like joy for telling all this information to strangers. But I like to get up here and share my perspective. One, because we bring ourselves to our work, our biases and our experiences, and I want to be transparent about who I am and the things that I care about but also because I believe that there's power in the challenges that we've gone through. Um, and I believe that showing up here myself and talking about my own experiences might encourage others to do the same. Um, in fact, I think that our differences are strengths and our past difficulties and hopefully triumphs can lead to heightened empathy, endurance, grit, and the type of clear-eyed, clear-minded optimism that we really need in times like these. And when working in government spaces where we get to <laughs> serve the needs of so many equally unique people coming from their own complex and nuanced backgrounds and themselves often navigating incredibly varied and sometimes inhospitable environments. 
So I'm thrilled to bring my whole self here today <laughs> and every day in my work. Thank you for bearing with my awkward introduction. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> I don't know why I do this to myself. but. <laughs> um, so I was instructed to show you some of my past work. So I'm going to give you a little primer or a little, um, I don't know, wet your palette, I guess, with some partnership examples from previous work um, that we've done. My team was the brainpower behind putting President Obama on behind between two ferns with Zach Galifianakis. Uh, so this video um, led to a huge bump in traffic for healthcare.gov during an open enrollment season. So just for fun viral video, actually strategic planning and a part of a digital strategy to help get more Americans signed up for healthcare, done in support for health and human services. On a very different note, <laughs> my team um, partnered with former U.S. Secretary of Energy, uh, Secretary Moniz, to craft the Iran nuclear deal um, and craft the digital strategy and the rapid response um, strategy that accompanied it and helped uh, kind of present it to the globe. It's auto playing, that's good. <laughs> I led the design and um, the digital strategy for a couple of the State of the Union addresses dur during the Obama administration, uh, enabling the public to engage more deeply throughout uh, this speech and around the speech, partnering with members of cabinet to create this comprehensive content, um, and then technically with some of the folks at Acquia who supported us in some of the builds that we did. The We the People Petitions platform was imagined in 2010 and then launched by the White House Office of Digital Strategy in 2011. And this was the first digital means, as a reminder, to petition the White House on an issue that matters to you. And if you reach a certain threshold, be guaranteed a response, which is actually, you know, your First Amendment right, <laughs> it turns out. So having a means to do this easily where you actually knew that you were participating in a process um, was really important to us. I was lucky enough to work on this for a number of different years, but uh, more deeply uh, towards the end of the second term when we redesigned it, uh, really getting to pull all that we learned uh, in those four years on uh, practicing agile methodologies, methodologies to be much kind of quicker and more thoughtful about uh, the build. And we partnered with Dustin Senos, who's a designer and developer, um, to pull this together. And then last but not least, Ann Partners partnered with Health and Human Services and Indian Health Service to perform a complete assessment of the electronic uh, health record system. We provided comprehensive report identifying the core concepts and functional needs of a modern health IT system, which directly impacts the lives of native Alaskan and American Indian populations. We also developed use cases that can be used uh, continuously to help um, evaluate possible solutions moving forward. Whew, okay, I'm trying to get a lot in <laughs> in my 20 minutes, so bear with me. Hopefully you're learning some things. Now, if you're like me, some of you kind of roll your eyes at that. You're like, okay, I didn't sign up for like a portfolio presentation. <laughs> your company's name is Ann Partners. You're like, you're going to try to sell us on a partnership opportunity here. That is not the goal. Um, my biggest goal with this short talk is actually um, to provide you some examples, encourage you to, jo to join uh, in partnerships uh, in some thoughtful ways moving forward. And so with that intent, the rest of my presentation is going to give you three very unique examples of partnerships that have nothing to do with me <laughs> and nothing to do with and partners. So I promise the goal here is to provide you value. Are you ready for the second phase? <laughs> <laughs> Too many phases for 20 minutes. All right, how many of you are familiar with OXO? Good number of people, okay. Well, here's the story of OXO from their website. Sam Farber founded OXO when he saw his wife, Betsy, having trouble holding her peeler due to arthritis. This got Sam thinking, why do ordinary kitchen tools hurt your hands? Sam saw an opportunity to create more thoughtful cooking tools that would benefit all people with or without arthritis and promised Betsy he would make a better peeler. That sounds great. <laughs> you can see like the evolution of the tool and the final one here for this peeler. 
But my friends, this is actually a little like revisionist history. I know it's on their site, but it's bullshit. Um, <laughs> that's, that's not how it happened. Um, <laughs> it's close, but it's off. And the little details on this one actually matter pretty uh, big deal. Um, for those of you that don't know, OXO is a great company. I don't want to just get up here and like seem like I'm bashing them. They are one of the best examples of universal design um, and have generated more than a thousand products globally that are extremely accessible for people uh, of different needs, situations, and abilities. Um, but how did this product actually come about? I think it matters, so we'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, a good friend of mine, Liz Jackson, who's a disability advocate and a disabled designer, dug really deep on this because that story didn't quite sound right to her. Um, and so she shared the story with me as well as the New York Times, because she's Liz and she's great. Um, so in fact, <laughs> the original OXO product was the, that vegetable peeler that you saw, the black rubber handled OXO Good Grips vegetable peeler. That's a really long name. <laughs> Um, developed in 1989 by Betsy Farber, who had arthritis with her husband, Sam, a product designer. Y'all hear the difference in that? <laughs> oh yeah, it's a familiar difference. The small word with um, makes a huge difference in this story. When the designer, in this case Sam Farber, designed with a member of the community, not for her, in this case his wife, they created one of the most successful products that has been made to date and is still one of the most valued um, products from the OXO line. Um, and OXO has grown significantly, in part because they're using those same principles in all the products that they make. Even if they don't write about it on their blog, <laughs> they should update a little bit. So Liz Jackson said in her 2018 New York Times article, as a disabled designer, I've come to believe that products are a manifestation of relationships. Disabled people have long been integral to design processes, though we're frequently viewed as inspiration rather than active participants. Okay, um, so good partnerships, I believe, see no individual as a victim of their circumstances simply to be helped but rather see them as their own types of subject matter experts um, and experiential experts in the problems and the opportunities. When they're approached as collaborators and co-designers and partners who are necessary to the process, amazing things can actually happen. So here you see the Latin expression that recently came to be more prominent by the disability rights community. Nothing about us without us, is the translation. Um, since then, it's also become embedded in a range of revolutionary approaches, including some things that you've heard earlier. Human-centered design, also abbreviated HCD pretty frequently. Um, design thinking, it's also embedded in the approach for the International Organization for Standardization, ISO uses that. And it's referenced, but not fully adopted, by the National Institute of Standards and Technology here in the US, NIST. So if I have NIST folks, happy to talk about that, <laughs> um, integrating it fully. Um, so to summarize for this, this first example is really just a simple product that was created inclusively by designing with uh, the clients. This model scaled beautifully for OXO and is a reason that they're so successful. So if you're interested in designing more inclusively and um, getting to know Liz Jackson, who is you know, a badass, <laughs> I recommend reading her New York Times article. Also talks about the accessibility movement uh, and the disability community. Accessible America is also a fantastic read on the subject by Bess Williamson, and it calls out so many technologies that have been misattributed and products that have been misattributed, including the iPhone screen, which was uh, created by uh, disabled designers to uh, solve some of their needs and then adopted by <laughs> so many people who are uh, not yet disabled. And then I've got something in here. These inclusive design cards I made a couple years ago. If you're interested in creating solutions to be more inclusive as a designer yourself, a writer, um, it's got some easy tips and mind um, exercises to shift your mindset. Next, I'm gonna take you to New York City. 
Okay. One man in New York remains unparalleled in his accomplishments over 44 years of city planning. Accomplishments which are still across New York, shaping how we experience it today. 416 miles of highways, 13 bridges, 658 playgrounds for housing. Um, he uh, created solutions for 150,000 people. He's created ton tunnels, parkways, beaches, <laughs> stadiums, the UN building, Lincoln Center. It's pretty amazing, right? It's a whole lot for one person to achieve. Unelected, he had unprecedented um, influence and power over public, public works through 12 concurrent city, state, and federal appointments. He wasn't in government, but he worked with government and was wealthy and influential consultant or partner to government. Does anybody know who I'm talking about? Do you people do? <laughs> You're like, the name is on the slide, Ashley. <laughs> okay. <laughs> You're reading, it's good, paying attention. Uh, <laughs> so yes, this is Robert Moses that we're talking about. Um, there's just one big problem with Robert Moses, and that's that he was, you know, a segregationist. Well, that's a pretty big problem. And according to Robert Caro, uh, a power broker. So Robert Caro, the former newspaper reporter, actually wrote a Pulitzer Prize winning book about uh, Robert Moses 45 years ago this year. In it, he details how Moses started out as an idealist but soon realized that ruthless pragmatism got more things done in his way. An early example of this is when deep in the subclauses of a New York State um, bill, he buried the redefinition of the word appropriation so that he could, um, once the bill passed, he got power to the Long Island State Park Commission, which he had control over, that would enable it to um, write its own laws hire its own police force to enforce those laws, and then its own prosecutors to prosecute. Does that seem normal to anybody in here? That's, that's not great. Uh, to demonstrate his power, this sort of behavior enabled him in other instances to run the Tri-Bureau tri Bridge and Tunnel Authority like a shadow government within New York City with its own police force, private island, and its own tax revenue that he was collecting from the tolls people paid crossing the bridges. To demonstrate his intent, Moses intentionally built low overpasses on the highways to keep communities separated because public buses wouldn't be able to drive down those highways. He knew fully well that the African-American community at the time um, largely did not have family-owned vehicles. So that kept people from getting to the beaches or crossing neighborhood boundaries. He also demolished uh, communities, displacing over a million people at once and removed language in a city contract that would have prevented discrimination. I get angry talking about Robert Moses. <laughs> you're like, you see, you see the list of accomplishments, you're like, wow, that's amazing. And then you're like, oh. <laughs> so what's the lesson here? You don't always have to feel uh, the magnitude of responsibility that we have when working in the government and um, social sector. And that's kind of necessary, right? Because we need to get work done. And if you're feeling the pressure <laughs> every single day of working on these, uh, you know, for so many people, these communities, these powerful things that could actually kind of stifle the work um, and can be staggering. That said, we are shaping lives with our work. Sometimes it's a moment, and other times the designs that we create um, will place, uh, will affect millions of lives um, and change our landscape for decades to come. Who you lend your influence, and you do have influence, I know it doesn't always feel like it, who you lend your influence, power, funding, and the pen to design solutions with, <laughs> Um, needs to be able to listen to communities and channel the needs of communities that they're intended to support. So Moses was not that partner to the community. He had his own agenda. You can learn from this and choose partners who have shared values and who practice things like human-centered design and care to learn from and in service to the communities that they work for. Procurement friends, I'm sure you have thoughts on this too. 
So in summary, the second example is really a simple civic designer practicing exclusion by wielding unearned power through manipulation. This is the cautionary tale um, to choose partners based on shared values and focus on delivering for real people. I do recommend reading The Power Broker by Robert Caro. It's a fantastic book. And then if you're interested in learning a little bit more about how to avoid exclusion when doing, um, creating products, services, things for our communities, these th uh, three books are really fantastic. Mismatch by Kat Holmes, Technically Wrong by Sarah Watcher Botcher, and then Ruined by Design by Mike Montero. All right, how am I doing? Oh yeah, I'm, I'm over time. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Um, <laughs> for my last example, I'm going to take you to a hospital to meet an industrial designer. Um, okay, so Doug Dietz is that industrial designer. Years ago, with more than 20 years experience under his belt, um, he helped lead design and development of a high-tech medical imaging systems at General Electric. Um, and he had just wrapped up a two and a half year project. His MRI scanner um, has been submitted for an international design award. He's really excited. He knows it's technically proficient. So he goes to see it in action at a hospital. Um, while there, the technician asks him to step out of the room because they have a patient coming through. And he gets to see firsthand how this young girl walking with her parents is terrified. She's trembling as she approaches the room. Her father's whispering to her, we talked about this, you can do it. And he's witnessing all of this as she approaches a machine that he's designed and he's so proud of. It gets so bad, she's crying. She can't stay still enough to lie in the machine for the scan. It gets so bad, <clears throat> they call in an anesthesiologist so that they can scan her. Okay, Doug learns later that at the time, about 80% of pediatric patients who had to have MRI scans um, I'm getting emotional, <laughs> I care, um, actually had to um, be sedated because I couldn't stay still enough for these scans. So Doug was obviously pretty changed by this experience, really changed his perspective on the technology, but he didn't know what to do about it. Luckily, Doug's boss had heard of Stanford's D School and ended up sending Doug to take a human-centered design course and class where he could uh, learn about the approach. Um, so he learned to observe and talk to clients, the end users of his products, to actually learn about their experiences and their needs. He learned he needed to collaborate with members of his company and those outside of his company. Um, so he wanted to take this cross-pollination, this methodology, and pull it back into his work. It actually built up his creative confidence again because uh, he was pretty devastated from that experience. But let's be honest, we all kind of could probably see the problem here. This thing has shipped. <laughs> it's a very expensive machine. It's technically proficient. It met all the requirements, right? So what could Doug do in this experience to make it right? Well, he wasn't redesigning the technology. He learned he needed to fix the experience for the customers. That's what really mattered there. So putting what he learned into play, he observed children with a machine, talked to child life specialists to understand the pediatric patients went through in the experience. He sought help from volunteers at GE, experts at the local children's museum, and doctors and staff at a couple of the hospitals that had his technology. They're going to pull me off of the cane in a second. <laughs> Almost done. Um, so they created their first prototype um, that would become the Adventure Series. Uh, scanner and piloted it with the University of Pittsburgh's Medical Center Children's Hospital. So what they did is they transformed the MRI machine into an experience. They made an experience for the children based on the kids' needs. So in this example, um, one of the first ones that they did is a pirate ship. The kids get to dress up. They're just told they're, they have to lay still for their voyage. <laughs> that's it. <laughs> you know, that's actually pretty simple. <laughs> Like, and afterwards, they get to collect treasure on the other side of the room. So it's a really cute experience that shifted um, things greatly. Um, and more than that, so it, it shifted the experience for the kids. It um, changed the patient satisfaction scores. They went up 90%, relieving all the anxiety that Doug had first experienced. But it also ticked boxes for every other stakeholder and audience group. 
it really it um, changed the affordability for patients because they were no longer being charged for the anesthesiologists that had to come. Um, and because children were able to get through this experience faster, a single machine could scan more children, helping more families. It also meant that the hospitals are recouping their costs of investing in the machine much faster. So Doug might have been a designer, but that group that came up with the Adventure Series solution here was actually comprised of people from across different industries collaborating on the solution together beyond their individual capabilities. So in summary, this third example is an industrial designer turned design thinker, practicing empathy um, and humility while co-creating with cross-functional partners. Now, it wouldn't have been better if Doug did this initially <laughs> instead of retroactively, but still a really great example of um, what these techniques can do. And it's a reminder to work with cross-functional groups to create solutions. So if you're not a designer, but want to create really fantastic experiences and build up your creative confidence, I might recommend these uh, two books for you. And with that, I hope you find your next partners for your next adventure. Thank you. Oh.